Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rachel Kasten. Welcome to the Center for Geospatial Analytics Geospatial Forum. We have a very special edition of our forum today. Um, we get to hear from some of our doctoral students. Um, so we are going to kick things off with Martine Matthew, who is a third year student uh, advised by Dr. Jennifer Richmond Bryant. And Martine will be presenting on spatial predictive dispersion modeling of particulate matter concentrations as surrogates for exposure in Colfax, Louisiana. Um, thank you, Rachel, for the introduction. Um, so today I'm very excited to present to you uh, some results of my project. Uh, and my presentation today will be about, uh, uh, as Rachel just said, about spatial predictive modeling of uh, fine particulate matter using a model. So I will start uh, by introducing my research project site in Colfax. So uh, Colfax here is a small town of about uh, 2,500 people with 90% of them living below the poverty line. So near Colfax, there is uh, another small community called The Walk. So uh, in the neighborhood of uh, these two communities, there is an uh, open burn, open detonation facility that tweets uh, that tweet, um, uh, hazardous waste, including military munitions and ordnance, fireworks, and other explosive materials. So this waste, uh, it results of um, uh, under production of particulate matter of different size fraction. So what are the consequences for us as human being with emission of particulate matter? So first of all, uh, air pollution is considered the fourth leading cause of death worldwide with uh, PM 2.5 responsible for more than 60% of the 6.75 million of deaths caused by air pollution. Uh, in, uh, sorry. So in more detail, PM, uh, when present in our environment, penetrate our respiratory tract and the finest particles, including PM 2.5, they are able to penetrate our lungs until the alveolar region. And PM 2.5 specifically, uh, they have been found to be associated with many health problems, including cardiovascular uh, diseases, cancer, and adverse birth outcomes. Uh, in Colfax specifically, so residents, they have experienced adverse health effects, uh, such as uh, thyroid, cardiovascular, and respiratory diseases uh, that can potentially be associated with PM emission by the burning facility. So uh, 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 to help Colfax residents understand the, the, the health risks from exposure to the facility emission. So my main research project objective uh, uh, concerns uh, uh, performing spatial and statistical modeling of PM 2.5 and its components to understand the spatial extent of contaminant exposure. So the, the, the my general approach uh, is to develop an hybrid assessment model, including uh, five measurements in Colfax and dispersion modeling techniques. So uh, for today, the presentation covers only the special prediction from dispersion modeling. Uh, I will walk you through the, the, the uh, air mode uh, framework. So dispersion modeling allows for prediction of pollutant concentrations by characterizing the atmospheric processes that cause the dispersion from an emission source. For my study, I use uh, the dispersion modeling framework developed by EPA Air Mode for the period of January to December, 2022. So to do so, uh, first I process meteorological data using uh, AirMet. Then after incorporating land use data to calculate the surface uh, roughness. So we found that about 75% of the speed varied from uh, 3.6 uh, until uh, 11 meters per second with about 60% of the wind blowing in the, in the southeast direction 
towards the study site. Uh, then I incorporated um, into Hermod uh, a second set of data consisting of uh, uh, a 10 meter resolution of a uh, digital elevation model. And also uh, I incorporated um, uh, like 10 on-site data point considered as uh, sensitive receptors where our where we have uh, the network of uh, PM 2.5 monitors uh, and uh, uh, that will allow us to have an idea of the concentrations at specific location. So these data, they were all processed in AirMap. So the small blue point uh, uh, that uh, you see is the, the emission source on the Colfax, the burn facility. And, um, and the, the, the red dots, they are the sensitive receptors uh, all around the, the facility. So uh, uh, after that, we also uh, incorporated like uh, some uh, some additional uh, parameters, uh, including emission rate. So to calculate the emission rate, so I I, I use specifically uh, the the burn log data uh, um, uh, for quantity and types of waste reported in 2020. So and uh, using the mass uh, burn and the emission factor for each type of waste. So I, I also use the operating days, the time of burning and, uh, and the area surface of the facility. So that uh, allow me to estimate uh, a, a, an emission rate of about uh, 130 microgram per second per square meter. And uh, all of the output obtained plus uh, the additional defined parameters, they were processed in air mode to compute PM2.5 concentration and provide an interpolated profile for the, the uh, an eight hour averaging time. So in uh, uh, the concentration, as you can see, it varies uh, from uh, four microgram per grade meter until uh, over 400 microgram per grade meter. And also the dispersion uh, kind of follow the same, the same, um, the same pattern or the same trend with the wind direction profile. And uh, 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 and also our interpretation is that uh, the closer someone is from the facility, so uh, uh, the more this person is exposed to PM 2.5 or is exposed to a higher concentration of PM 2.5. And uh, uh, the two communities that we have, we have uh, the work kind of um, uh, located here. So uh, the work is more exposed uh, uh, with a higher concentration between about uh, 10 to 20 uh, microgram per cubic meter. And also, uh, um, uh, uh, but um, for, the, for the other community, uh, Corfac located kind of here, so they are exposed to a less uh, concentration uh, between five, six, and eight uh, microgram per cubic meter. And this is kind of a, a, a short video of the, of the um, I mean, for a one day time period, uh, uh, I mean, not, not one day, not, a, a little less than one day. So you can see how the, the movement of the, of the plume or the movement of the 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 I mean, PM uh, emission uh, in this region. So I will leave it for you. Guys. And this is kind of uh, um, uh, I took just a specific day in in February just to see how the plume will move uh, for a specific uh, on time period about. Uh, um, uh, less than an hour. Okay, I think I can stop it there. Okay, and um, uh, so our conclusion of the, let me want to move. Okay, so our conclusion of uh, this, I mean, this section of the study. So our next step will be, of course, to to incorporate uh, uh, in our hybrid model the uh, statistical uh, modeling. Uh, specifically, we will be using land use regression, but for the the the, the only the, the dispersion modeling. So our conclusion is that both communities they are exposed to PM two point five with half 
of the sensitive receptors being exposed to concentration over the EPA standard for PM2.5. And uh, 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 of course, that means that this is a call for environmental justice since we have uh, uh, a community of, uh, of uh, I don't know, of many people living in this area. Thank you. So we're gonna save questions until the end. Um, so I'd like to introduce our second presenter. Um, this is Ian McGregor, who is a fourth year student advised by Dr. Josh Gray. Um, and he'll be speaking on the importance of trade-offs between detection time and accuracy for multi-source deforestation monitoring. <laughs> I did not memorize this, which is fine. I have notes, and that's why they exist. So I can use. Ah, brilliant. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, hi everyone. My name's Ian, and I'm going to be talking to you about my doctoral dissertation research. Uh, here I've labeled it as tortoise or hare. The importance of trade-offs between detection time and accuracy for multi-source deforestation monitoring. It worked when I tried it. <laughs> oh, is that on the computer? Maybe. Okay, it's not just me. That's great. There we go. Okay, cool. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so deforestation is a well-known major issue affecting ecosystem and biodiversity resiliency. Now, the good news is that we have a lot of satellite data, which helps us detect deforestation more easily than before. Now, there are several methods to do so, we, but we primarily rely on improving methods of change detection. Whoops, sorry. That's what I got. Um, change detection is usually done with time series analysis. So let's look at some sample data. Now, here we have a time series model. With change detection, we look for two different things. Is a signal change unexpected and is it persistent? Now, clearly in this time series, we have an example of where this occurs. Now, with recent advances in remote sensing, we are focusing on monitoring Earth's surface as opposed to just looking at retrospective mapping, where we want to detect as fast as possible. And so to do so, we turn to a multi-source approach. For example, we can combine Landsat 8 data with Sentinel-2 data, and this combination helps us get more frequent observations um, because, and therefore we can get faster detections. Now, this particular example has monsoon season with constant cloud. And this can be an issue because both Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 can't get valid observations when it's cloudy. Now, we can further improve our multi-source method here by including um, data from synthetic aperture radar or Sentinel-1, which can see through clouds. So together, time series modeling and multi-source data can be incredibly powerful in detecting disturbances, and it helps us get closer to doing those near real-time uh, detections. Now, all of this is great, but we still have a major question of when is deforestation considered detected in the first place? Now, to illustrate this, I will use a tortoise and a hare, representing slower and faster techniques. And yes, I know it's a box turtle. That's fine. For this, it's a tortoise. Um, so here's a multi-source sample time series. Now, if we use a fast detector, we'd be very optimistic 
about each new observation's accuracy and probably labeled these observations as disturbances. Now, of course, all of them are anomalous, but they're also short-lived. However, if we use a slow detector, we'd be more conservative in our optimism and not label disturbance until we clearly had persistent anomalies. So the goal of multi-source near real-time monitoring, therefore, is to find a solution where we can detect deforestation both as quickly as possible and as accurately as possible. Um, now, unfortunately, some studies have looked into this and they were not able to find an actual optimum between these two. So our study here aimed to push the limits of deforestation monitoring and see if we can do three things. Number one, detect small disturbances with a new multi-source near real-time approach. Number two, detect if Sentinel-1 is actually going to be useful here. And number three, quantify the trade-offs between latency and accuracy and look at that full spectrum. And then of course, we just wanted to make it hard on ourselves and look at this all in a hard case where it's a tropical monsoon dominated system in an area without a lot of prior research. Classic. <laughs> so for all of that, we decided to focus on Myanmar as a country is one of the most forested in Southeast Asia, but it has high rates of deforestation. And specifically we'll be focused on the Northern half of the country because it contains the largest concentration of intact forests, but has a good representation of different forest types. Now we manually identified our training points with planescope imagery. And using Google Earth Engine, we downloaded surface reflectance data for Landsat 8, Sentinel-2, and Sentinel-1 backscatter for our study period. So from each sensor, we calculated time series model either for NDVI or greenness or backscatter for Sentinel-1. Now you can see here we fit either a mean or sinusoidal harmonic model to represent those time series. We then calculated the standardized residuals and attempted to harmonize them by combining the data into one cohesive um, time series, which you can see on the right. We next applied an exponentially weighted moving average to get a weighted time series of those standardized residuals, which you can see there. From there, we created a logistic model relating the pre and post disturbance values over all of the training data. And we then calculated individual disturbance probability time series for every single day. We can finally apply the method at landscape scale where we can get the daily probability of time of uh, deforestation at a 10 meter resolution over this landscape. Now here, this is about 60,000 hectares. So this is pretty straightforward, right? Not complicated. Um, but we still have a major question of how do we define the exponentially weighted moving average calculation? And the reason for why I asked this is because EWMA, you look at only the most recent observations first in general. The actual weight that you use to determine how much you consider those previous observations are determined by how the how much memory we assign to the system. This is also called the lambda value. So I'll show you what this means. A lower lambda means longer memory. So we consider observations from long ago as important. And we also take longer to be confident about the disturbance. But a higher lambda is the opposite, where we only consider the last few observations as important and we therefore spike in probability faster. So to get truly representative results, we assess the entire spectrum when analyzing the training data. So here's a plot of the F1 scores or accuracy um, per day post disturbance here with just Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2. You can clearly see a trade-off where the slower detections or those in purple ultimately are more confident, but they take much longer to be so. Now, when we included Sentinel-1, we were surprised, yep, we were surprised to discover how much this affected the results given the extra observations we did have during the monsoon season. And we believe this is in large part due to the high noise of Sentinel-1 observations. Now we can see these trade-offs a bit more clearly with the accuracy and lag plots themselves. Um, so this is just a basic schematic. And here you can see how allowing for more memory in the system or a lower lambda leads to better accuracy, here this is false positive rate, but at the expense of detection time. And conversely, higher lambdas or less memory gives us faster detections, but worse accuracy. Overall, though, our approach yields pretty good detection times and accuracies for a range of disturbances. And in total, um, about 40% of our training disturbances were smaller than the size of a Landsat pixel here at 900 meters squared. So overall, pretty good. So our final takeaways, number one, our new method is able to detect a wide range of disturbances, uh, sizes rather, relatively quickly, even using the slowest Lambda. 
Number two, despite its ability to provide more data, Sentinel-1 uh, does not significantly improve our results. Number three, we quantify the trade-offs between latency and accuracy in our approach and like previous studies found no optimum. So therefore you cannot have your cake and eat it too. Um, and because of this, we emphasize that these trade-offs must be reported uh, when you're reporting the results of these studies, they need to be reported to the users of these algorithms because otherwise it's not usable. It's only usable to us in academia, but not to those on the ground. And finally, our research pushes the limits of deforestation monitoring with a simple multi-source method that gets some pretty good results in a difficult scenario. Thank you. Our next speaker is Annie Polyukonis. She is advised by Dr. Helena Matasheva and also Dr. Tom Perucker from the EPA. Um, and she will be presenting agricultural field delineations for use in large scale ecological risk assessment. Oh, no, there we go. No? There, okay, cool. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so like Rachel said, I'm a second year CGA student. I am also an ORISE fellow with the US EPA. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the work that I do to support the agency in developing spatial analyses for ecological risk assessment. So when, uh, evaluate, oops, that's hard to see. Um, when we evaluate, uh, when evaluating spatial data or spatial aspects essentially of how an environment may be impacted by a pesticide, Typically, the agency is using the USDA cropland data layer or the CDL. This is a really great data source. Um, and because we don't have really good information about where pesticides are applied and how they are applied specifically on crops, a lot of times we have to use CDL information or other types of crop information as a proxy for where we think exposure extents may be occurring. Now, the problem with the CDL is that it does not differentiate field boundaries. So Essentially, when we look at transitions between individual crops, a lot of times we're left with this mixed pixel effects, both within where we think the fields are and at the edges of the transitions between different crops. This has implications for how we identify particular types of habitat, particularly when we're looking at endangered species or groups of endangered species. And it also has implications for how we might model runoff or spray drift. So kind of similar to that model that Martine was talking about, if we don't have well-defined edge boundaries, it makes us really hard to scale this, uh, makes it really hard to scale this to essentially any other location than a really localized scale. So the goal for this work was to try and create a straightforward, relatively straightforward, um, and flexible field delineation approach based on unique pixel histories contained within the CDL. So we want to try and utilize the data that we do have and see if there's some sort of patterns that we can derive um, and leverage those crop pattern histories to figure out where those sequences are occurring enough for us to figure out, okay, there's a field here. So we do this in a simplified two-step workflow. Um, in the first part of the workflow, we are collapsing roughly 14 years of data um, to define these unique pixel histories. And again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to leverage um, that information over time to identify where those crop patterns have consistently occurred. In the second step, we're applying a relatively straightforward geostatistical method um, that's focal window based um, and along with a series of modifiable, modifiable parameter settings to define edges. Um, for this work, we were doing this in nine different counties in the Midwest. No, you're good. Um, it's not showing up for our. Oh, no. Okay. Cool. Hold, please. We can do the messed up one, and I think it'll be as fun. 
We don't have to do the next one. Is it Vance? No. <coughs> oh, no. Okay. No, I put in one. Oh, there we go. Okay, let's try it again. No, nope. back. No, nope. still. No, okay. It's a bit of a lag. All right, just pretend that didn't happen. Um, all right, so again, we, we're starting off in nine different counties in the Midwest, and the idea is, is we're trying to target counties that have a range of different crop types. So we're targeting counties that have up to 80% agricultural coverage as a total proportion of land cover, and some counties that have down to 20%. We're also targeting counties that have a range of crop types, so we're looking at areas that are majorly uh, dominated by major crops such as corn and soy, and then also areas that... Um, have a mixture, so things like orchards or vegetable crops, et cetera. There we go. So again, the idea is that we're leveraging multiple years of the CDL to try and extract these unique pixel sequences that are hopefully gonna tell us a little bit about how those patterns have evolved over time and how we can try and identify where those crop boundaries start and stop. So because we are looking at a range of agricultural counties, what we wanna do is account for areas where field densities may be small or they may be relatively large. So we have two different settings that we're testing for this. We're testing a large setting where we're mostly uh, honing in on field sizes of 10 acres or more and a small setting. So we're looking at fields of two acres or more. And the idea is, is we are um, identifying these unique sequences sequences at the individual pixel level. This is an example just using four years worth of data. And what we're trying to do is target these yellow pixels. So essentially what that means to us is that probably in one of the four years of interest, there is some sequence pattern where the algorithm for the CDL didn't identify it correctly. So the focal window analysis allows us to correct that. Then we've got a set of processing parameters that we stick through the workflow. So we do things like tar target different edges, we target holes within fields, we target individual isolated pixel clumps depending on the acreage sizes. And then we're left with a vectorization that represents those unique sequences that we can then use to represent those field edges. Once we do that, we extract the original CDL using the mode to those vectors. And the output is something that represents the field delineations while still reflecting general patterns across the CDL. We don't have very much time, so I'm going to show you one way that we evaluate how this performs. Um, so one of the things we did is compare the total sum crop acreage to the census of agriculture. And the idea here is we want to get as close to zero as possible. Zero essentially means that there is no difference in reported acreage. So that means that our field outputs are doing pretty well in comparison to metrics from the census of agriculture. Greater than zero means that the fields are typically underpredicted, so we're probably missing some areas that are actually fields according to the census of agriculture. And less than zero means that we're actually overpredicting, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. That probably means that the acreage setting that we're using in the workflow can be adjusted to try and account for some of those crops that we may be overpredicting. So first I'll show the result with 50% ag. So our goal was to get within roughly 5% for each of these counties. And we did a pretty good job using the large setting. Again, that's with the 10 acres. Um, we did pretty well for all of those top three counties. When we get down to the small setting, we definitely get really close for Illinois. Um, and we overpredict for Michigan and Wisconsin. So probably there's some field acreage that we could modify to get that value closer to zero. Now, unfortunately, the counties with less than 30% ag don't do so hot, which is not that surprising. Um, a lot of these counties that we targeted have much smaller field size densities, so probably it's not gonna match as well. We definitely underpredict for the large, and then we actually do tend to overpredict a little bit for some of our counties when we use the small uh, setting. So probably there's something we could do there to adjust the field acreages to get closer to zero, even for those counties. Here's a visual output. So the idea is, is we're trying to target these fields that have that mixed pixel effect along with the edges between trans transitional classes. And this is really kind of the gold standard. This is what we're looking for. We want something that we can use at fairly broad scales that we can input into a model like 
for example, Martin's model or other types of exposure and effects model that allow us to figure out where we think potential applications are going to start and stop. So in summary, the method again works pretty well in the majority agricultural counties. So those counties that had greater than 50% of their agricultural coverage dominated by crops did pretty good. Um, it, it can be adapted for areas with less than 50%. Because we have these flexible parameter settings that allows for variable acreage inclusion, we can go ahead and modify that depending on the county and depending on the crops. Um, future work, which I'm just starting to get into now, is going to be able to use this outputs in various types of exposure and effect models. So we're trying to see if we can use this with models like AgDrift, which is similar to AirMod, um, or other types of aquatic or spatial models that help us to uh, look at drift or to look at runoff. And that's it. All right. Our Last speaker is coming up, but be thinking about the questions that you have for everybody. We will be taking those at the very end. Um, so next is Felipe Sanchez, who is a second year student advised by Dr. Gustavo Machado. And he will be speaking on spatiotempor spatiotemporal relative risk distribution of porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus in the United States. Thanks. That's what I got. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like happening. Thanks for the introduction. So yeah, um, as Rachel mentioned, my name is Felipe Sanchez. I'm a second year PhD student at CGA, advised by Gustavo Machado and Dr. Chris Jones. And this is uh, work related to my chapter one. Rachel just mentioned spatial temporal relative risk distribution of porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus. Um, start off with some background because not a lot of people know about pigs. Um, so porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus, virus, which I'll be referring to as PERS because it's kind of a mouthful, um, is one of the most economically important diseases in the United States. Uh, it's endemic. It causes approximately $500 million in losses in production every year uh, due to decreases in reproductive health, uh, growth, and increased mortality in piglets. And it's characterized by this seasonal trend that typically occurs during the winter months or the kind of cold season. And so there's been a lot of studies done on PERS, but there's still a lot of unknown factors related to the spatial epidemiology. But mainly, PERS transmission is governed by two main routes. Uh, first is the movement of pigs between farms. Obviously, that's kind of obvious. And then the what's known as uh, local transmission or area spread, which is kind of indirect contacts between uh, pigs, uh, which is kind of like this umbrella term that is used for a lot of epidemiological processes that kind of just capture a lot of the things related to uh, proximity to infected farms and farm density. <clears throat> and so within these kind of epidemiological processes, there has been a lot of kind of efforts to kind of disentangle all of these uh, things that go on in proximity. So one of this is, that they found out is contaminated personnel uh, is very important when you move from infected farm to uh, uninfected farm. Um, trucks delivering pigs, so the trucks themselves can be infected and, and serve as a fomite to go to uninfected farms. Uh, feed, this is a little bit less understood, but there has been a lot of suggestions that, that feed could also play into it. Um, airborne viral particle dispersal, so we just, the main kind of uh, prevailing wind direction has an impact on, on kind of carrying that disease and they have been able to recover it in the air. And then equipment, so moving equipment from farm to farm. Has, so, obvious. so in order to kind of mitigate the transmission between farms, we kind of know, we have to know when and where enhanced biosecurity is needed and, and where these uh, areas need kind of further surveillance in order to provide targeted allocation of uh, disease control strategies. Uh, to do so, uh, we <laughs> went uh, through this process of developing these aims. Uh, the first one being defining the maximum distance at which the risk of PERS uh, is local transmission occurs, um, identifying differences between the different farm types. Uh, namely, in our study, we used uh, kind of the main five sows, so kind of mama pigs, 
Uh, finisher farms is kind of the farms where pigs are taken to grow out into their kind of final stages. Uh, nursery is when the pigs are weaned from the, the mothers and uh, placed into a different uh, farm. Isolation is more for kind of uh, um, cows or, or kind of female pigs that are not separated from the entire pack. And then more studs is the male pigs. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, we wanted to identify factors contributing to an increase or decrease in the occurrence of first outbreaks. So in order to address these aims, uh, firstly, we use an adaptive kernel density estimation to calculate spatial relative risk and spatial temporal relative risk. Uh, we decided on this uh, methodology because um, non-parametric and it's kind of, it, as the name suggests, it's, it adapts to depending on the density of the farms. So as an example, um, it would adapt to the others. So yeah, very dense region, it would adapt depending on how many farms are located in this region versus a very low dense region. And it would, uh, the kernel would, have, would adapt accordingly. And as you'll notice, the, the formulas are pretty similar it, with the exception of spatial temporal has this time step, which in our study were weekly time steps of outbreaks. And then, so the log F, uh, F hat represents the density estimates for the cases. And then the log G is the density estimates for the controls. Moving forward. Uh, and then to address the third aim, we use a Bayesian spatial temporal hierarchical model and included um, a lot of different covariates. Uh, for starters, we created a network of movement of pigs and calculated some between farm contact network metrics. Uh, and those were the metrics that we used and included in the model. Some environmental variables, um, those enclosed in that dark, dark, dark green kind of circle-ish thing, um, those are meant to represent a vegetation barrier around the farms. Uh, so some farms will construct these barriers around the farms to make, uh, to block some wind and potential for airborne particle dispersal, or what uh, Matthew was talking about. And um, elevation, number of days between 4 and 10 degrees Celsius and a uh, number of days below 20% relative humidity, then farm density, pig density, and some uh, biosecurity features, which is kind of like a novel aspect of this re research, uh, focusing on specific in-farm features that um, allow for biosecurity measures to be kind of taken. So we use site entry, line of separation, access points, and per perimeter buffer areas. All right, and the results. So, so here are the results for the spatial relative risk. And so what we're looking at is the relative risk surfaces for our study area going from low relative risk in the dark colors to high relative risk in the brighter colors. And those areas enclosed with the dark kind of gray areas represent like significant risk areas. And so some of the major findings from these results is that we found out that the maximum distance is 17 kilometers. Um, for um, for all the years in our study. Uh, within the areas of significant high risk, we found that south farms represented the majority of the cases. And also within those areas of significant risk, we found that finisher farms are the, represented the at-risk population, so the controls in those areas. For our spatial and temporal relative risk, um, so the plot on the left, uh, each column is a different year and each row is a different farm type. And all of those bars represent a, the entire population in a week. And so how we divided up the low, medium, and high risk, we basically took all of those relative risk values and plotted them, created a distribution, and using some quantile breaks, found out which correspond to low, medium, and high, and decided on a break from that. And so... Some of the major findings from this is that the majority of the farm population was considered low risk, so that's good. Um, South farms were consistently had more high risk farms than any other farm type. Um, and that the majority of the finisher farms were classified as low risk. And that kind of becomes important in it. And then for our uh, in the or Bayesian hierarchical model, um, our final model included uh, these three variables and 
which uh, produced an odds ratio. So for every unit increase in of those variables, uh, you had an increased odds of 1.08 for between farm contact metric odd degree. Um, we had uh, an odds ratio of 1.04 for the low sap or the line of separation, then 1.01 for uh, the number of days between four degrees Celsius and 10 degrees Celsius. So in conclusion, in conclusion uh, so we found out that the risk for purse transmission uh, is less than or equal to 17 kilometers. Uh, high risk areas were mainly comprised of cases of sow farms and finisher farms, um, which can point out to the differences in surveillance between these farm types. And that's kind of why I said that it's important. So surveillance of kind of diseases depends on certain farm types because some of them farms are more valuable than others. So uh, it might be a, a reason why we have more cases in, in certain farm types than others. Um, and that could also point out to potential um, maintenance of the, the, the disease the disease in downstream farms because um, they're not paying attention to that, that disease that much in downstream farms. And what I mean by downstream farms, so the pig industry is very kind of hierarchical. You have like sow farms on top and then it kind of each run in the ladder is a different farm type, but it all starts from kind of the top. And so some pigs are kind of moved around like that. And then Finally, the increased risk of PERS outbreaks associate, were associated with uh, outgoing movements, farm with more access points, and colder. Um, are there questions? Yeah, the plan was to have two or three minutes of questions within each 10 minute segment. Ten minutes goes by really fast. It does. <laughs> if there's any questions for any of the presenters, just ask them. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have too much time to get into it, but we do actually look at individual crops in the paper itself. So we look at the performance of the crops, depending on the settings that we use for the workflow. The accuracy kind of mostly comes in when, when we're trying to kind of look at the results. So for example, alfalfa is one of the crops that has pretty terrible accuracy, especially going back years. So that was kind of one of the crops where we looked at the accuracy, depending on the state, and then compared that to how well the field outputs were doing at, at capturing that at the individual field level for the years that we had data. So yes, we did use that to sort of verify against what the fields were, were showing us over time. Yeah, so um, for everyone online, the question was, did we consider weighing the different time series in addition to using the Lambda for uh, the memory? Um, no, we thought about it. Uh, we th if we had more time, yes. I mean, especially because when you look at Sentinel-1, it's like, should we be weighing that more when we have the clear, because we have, in Myanmar has clear delineations of when the monsoon season is and the wet and dry season. And so, yeah, that's definitely something um, and thank you for reminding me. I can put that in my discussion. <laughs> uh, future work, yeah. If we had more, if I had more time, I'd do some kind of like sensitivity analysis and see if weighing Sentinel One in that time would be better. But yeah, good idea. Yeah. 
She's on Zoom. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, in the dispersion modeling using AirMod, what uh, method or procedure did they use to specify or parameterize the boundary layer height? Um, I guess this question is for me. <laughs> on the, on the yes. <laughs> so uh, the data that I use for uh, uh, the meteorological data, is that the question? Yeah, but uh, what kind of meteorological data do you use to find out the boundary layer height? Oh, um, I use the the kind of uh, the um, surface uh, and the and the vertical profile. I use both of them, and uh, from uh, both of them, I do have the the uh, boundary layer height, and I also have uh, uh, a ton of uh, other other meteorological data, uh, humidity, temperature, and I mean, really about uh, about. Uh, uh, 10 to 12 parameters used. Uh, I mean, meteorological information were integrated into the model. You use any sounding data? Because mm -hmm. the boundary height could be several kilometers during the daytime. Um, that's a good question. I don't think that... Uh, Oh, actually, yes. Uh, the the um, what's the name again? Sorry, let me give the. Uh, yes, we did calculate the the. I forget the name of the term. Give me one second. Um, we calculated the. Um, I need to find out. Yes, we calculated the, the albedo. So it's not exactly the sun for itself, but of, of course that gives us an idea of the reflection. Albedo does not give you the boundary height you need. Oh, you say boundary bond height. Yes, I did use the boundary height. I thought you say uh, information related to the sun. Yes, I did use the boundary height for both of them, for both the surface and the, and the vertical profile. I hope that answers your question. Um, so the question is, so I don't really know much about the CPL data, so sorry if this is question but first like how is it derived and then how so what happens if you compare the accurate from the cdl data like the same analysis you do um when you compare it to the uh, to the yeah yeah so when you compare the cdl data um yeah <laughs> yeah sorry Um, so the CDL is derived uh, using Landsat data, um, and it started in 2008. Um, I believe the like the main driver is a random forest classifier, and then they keep modifying the algorithm every single year. So the accuracy has only improved over time. For individual crops, it tends to perform better. Like for example, corn and soy, it has a lot more ground truth data for those types of crops, so it does pretty well. Um, in terms of comparison to the census of ag, that's a really great question. So over time, it has gotten better, but that's definitely something we do note in the manuscript. Um, the census of ag is really good in later years. So right now, it's, it's, it's best to compare it to a year like 2017. The census of ag, unfortunately, we only have data for every single, every five years, I think it is. And while it's really good data, that's kind of the only, the only thing we have to compare against the CDL. Typically, it underpredicts the CDL underpredicts the comparison to the census of agriculture. So that's kind of another thing that we're trying to do is like account for that potential gap between the census of agriculture and what the CDL is saying by trying to say, okay, like if we capture these sequences over multiple years of time, does it tell a different story in terms of where these fields are probably located? Yeah, 
Does that answer your question, hopefully, well enough? I'm happy to, happy to talk more about it if you have more questions. Um, thank you all four of you for your talks. I thought they were all very interesting and very, I'm not familiar with any of the topics and I felt like I learned something from all of you. So I really appreciated you all making it very accessible. Um, you all did a good job with that. Um, my question is for Martine. Um, on the last slide, you mentioned that the TM numbers were over what the EPA recommended. And I'm curious if uh, the area in Louisiana knows about this and sort of like if you have any partners on the ground who are addressing this or is that like the next step? Like you found that these uh, numbers are over the EPA and now you're going to look into it more or what, where you might go from there. Um, thank you for the question. So uh, yes, I mean, uh, the, the site is a super fun research site. So that means that uh, it's, it's known kind of by the government that uh, it's um, polluted. Sorry, I just realized that um, that I was muted. So, uh, so as I said, like um, um, yes, the 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 site in Louisiana, it's a super fun research site. So that means it's well known by the government that it is polluted, and uh, we are working. And there is uh, one of the component of the of the of the project is um is um um community engagement, uh, and now uh, we are working. I mean, we 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 meet. I think uh, every three months, I mean, not me specifically, but the team on uh, there in Louisiana, they meet every three months with the, with the uh, community and presenting them like uh, the, the progress of the research and also kind of a report uh, of, of what is happening. So yes, uh, and, and even the, the, the receptors that I, the in-field uh, uh, receptors that I talk about. So they are the, um, uh, we have uh, uh, monitors uh, at people's house, so that means that they are aware of what we are doing, and we are we are, I mean, we are trying to communicate with them uh, about the, the results uh, each step. We have an online question uh, for Philippe. Did you consider the conditions of the farms in your study? Uh, for whoever asked that, could you expand on what you mean by conditions of farm? Like just like if, if it's deteriorated or uh, hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yep. Yep. Uh, so like the um uh, in, in reference to uh you had different categories of farms that you were actually monitoring and different they were played different roles in the process. Did you take into account if some of the farms were uh, you know, better taken care of, or or uh, did some of the farms w have a history of of uh, the communicable disease, that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, we did not take that into consideration. Um, definitely, some farms are more taken care of than others, especially that have more value. So, sow farms will definitely be. In, in definitely better state than the other types of farms. But um, no, we, we did not consider that, but that's a good point. Thank you. Okay, thanks. A great presentation. Thanks everybody. Anyone else? I have a question for Felipe. The statistical model that you used, um, it's, it's, it's a little, it seems like it's a little bit complex and I was wondering how you came to, why did you choose that particular model for doing this in epidemiology or this kind of disease transmission? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we use the INLA model um, specifically um, because it includes uh, the random space component of our farms and, and how it's kind of they're distributed. And so that is a typical model used for those scenarios. And that's kind of what was used in 
other studies. And so I created it into my study. And that's the short answer <laughs> to that question. Yeah. Ah. Um, no, but that is potentially the plan. <laughs> yeah, so the uh, an audience member asked if we could use POPs or uh, pester pathogens uh, spread model developed by CGA. Oh, plug. <laughs> yeah, um, yes, we've considered it. No, we have not done it. Felipe, this one's for you as well. Um, so it was it was short, but I noticed a very distinct pattern, spatial pattern on your predictions that was around the edges of your study area. Uh, and I can't remember if this was more likely or less likely. I remember that it was purple, dark, dark purple. Can you comment anything about what might be happening there? Yeah. So uh, the pattern that you're seeing is due to a little bit of manipulation that we had to do to prevent, to protect the confidentiality of the farms or the, uh, the companies involved in the study. So maybe I can, eh, I know, right. um, so I cut the values a little bit just to make that blob or surface that you were looking at a little bit more amorphous and kind of not very distinguishable as to kind of where this location is. Um, so after kind of in the borders, past that border, it was kind of all black and there's like no risk because there's no farms out there. Um, but that's, that's that pattern that you're seeing that kind of ring of very dark colors is just very low risk because there's no, no farms out there. Yeah. All right. Well, let's have one final huge round of applause for our presenters. Thanks everybody for coming today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks. That's one of the two people who transcribes things when it's not on the mic. It's really hard. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>